Today's sermon is entitled Growing in Christ Part 2. Today we're looking at 1 John chapter 2 verses 13b through verse 14. Well John has a two-fold purpose in this epistle. On the one hand he desires to give Christians, a, a true Christians, a fuller, more rooted understanding of and experience of the assurance of salvation. At the same time he's concerned that those who are not true believers but who think they are that they would not be falsely assured of their salvation. So we began a passage last week, this passage here in 1 John 2, verses 12 through 14, where John pauses and he recognizes how hard it is to both provide assurance and challenge inauthentic faith at the same time. Because he knows that even as he undercuts the, the, fa- the false salvation of some, that that can have an unintended consequence of, of causing true Christians to become insecure and Uh, to doubt their own salvation, the salvation of their hearts. And so he pauses to give this important word of assurance to humble, faithful believers, not only in his original audience, but really to all Christians in all ages and all congregations everywhere. So let's ask the Lord's help before we read his word today. Father, this is your word, and we humbly ask that as it is read and expounded, you would open it up to our understanding. We know that while faith has an intellectual aspect to it, that it is not an intellectual discipline. And so, Holy Spirit, will you work in our hearts even now? Speak to us and increasingly transform us into the image of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. So, 1 John chapter 2, beginning of verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for His name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know Him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Amen. May God write the eternal truths of His Word upon your heart and mine. Well, these verses are about growing in spiritual maturity. John is basically saying, given the fact that you're born again, uh, even though not everyone hearing this letter is born again, but generally speaking, given the fact that you're born again, where are you in your spiritual development? So he grants that we are in the family of God, but within, in any family, uh, people, just from a biological level, you know, people at different levels of maturity, babies, teenagers, young adults, parents, grandparents. So what stage of spiritual growth are you? That's his point here. Last week I proposed three headings to help us walk through this, these verses. There's the reassurance that our sins are forgiven. And then secondly, there's the recognition that we are all at different levels of spiritual growth and maturity. And then thirdly, there's the reinforcement of what John just told us. Last week we barely made it into the second point. Briefly then, in verse 12 we talked about the reassurance. The fact that John reassures those who have been born again that all our sins are forgiven. And the reason he does this is because he's been putting out these these tests. And of course he knows that none of us can follow God in perfect obedience, which is going to leave even true believers at times with a lot of angst. And so John knows that we need reassurance that our only standing before a holy God is in our faith union with Jesus Christ. And he speaks to us in the context of the gospel and he says, Dear believer, your, your sins are forgiven. Well then the, the second main heading in verse, 13, uh, verse 13 was the recognition that not all believers are at the same place in their spiritual growth. That while we are not all, that, that while we are all equally forgiven, we are not all equally developed. So in order to illustrate that we're all in this process of growing spiritually, John uses three basic categories, spiritual categories within the family of God, which are really three subpoints under this main heading of the recognition that we're all at different levels spiritually. Well, the first one is the intimacy stage, which are fathers, and, then, and that includes mothers, of, of course. The infantry stage, which are young men, including young women. And the infancy stage, which are boys and girls. And so John is using these terms, of course, not to refer to physical characteristics, but spiritual characteristics. We only made it through the first one last week, the intimacy stage and with fathers. The term fathers represents those who are the most mature in the Lord. <clears throat> They're those who have grown in the grace and the knowledge of Christ over the years. They've endured uh, significant suffering in different ways. They've had their faith tested. They have experiential knowledge of God in ways that have caused their faith to be strengthened. You've walked with the Lord long enough and experienced enough difficulty 
to give you perspective and humility and patience and understanding and wisdom and strength and, and tenacity and perseverance. And none of this is even from you. It's because the Holy Spirit is working in you, preserving you, carrying you along this journey in this divine matrix of suffering until you go with, to be with the Lord. These are people who have spent prolonged time in the Scripture. They've learned strong doctrine. They have had their minds renewed by the Scripture. They're teachable. Uh, they've fought many battles. They've sailed through many storms. They've defended the faith. They've been out on the front lines. They've grown over time, and most of them have had dark nights of the soul. So no one starts out at this stage. You grow into it. It takes time, and that's as far as we got last week. Well, now John comes to this middle category in verse 13, and we'll call that the infantry stage. When he says, I'm writing to you, young men, it's a Greek word that refers to men that would be anywhere from 20 to 40 years old. And again, John is, is using this as an illustration. So this is not just men he's talking about here, but women as well. And there's a broad spectrum within this level of growth. But it's, in this category, you've grown up out of your childhood, out of your baby stage, and you've matured into a young adult. You're full of stamina and strength and you're ambitious. You want your life to count for, for something that matters. And notice how he marks this stage. And that's why I, I called it the infantry stage, because he says, because you have overcome the evil one. And in in, it's in the past tense, notice. But that doesn't mean that you won't have any more battles with sin or you, there's no more weakness or no more defeats. It just means God has matured you to the point where you know, you have this resolve. I mean, it's like Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. You know, basically you can kill me, but I won't quit. And as a result, you've become a person who just, you're not willing to sit in the nursery any longer. You, you have to be in the game. You, you have to be in the battle. You want to advance to the front lines. You want to advance into enemy territory. You have a kingdom mindset. You want to see God bring others to Christ through you. You want to contend for the faith once delivered, uh, once for all delivered to the saints. You want to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. You, you've taken the diapers off. You've put on the full armor of God and you're resisting the devil. You're exposing error. You're defending the truth. You're not passive. You're active. You're loving people right where they are. You're not intimidated by difficult uh, circumstances or hard questions. You're less and less afraid of experiencing a dark night of the soul from time to time. Your life is engaged. You're not merely showing up for church anymore. You're no longer a spectator. You, have an, you want to have an assignment. You have, a, have to have a place to plug in. And throughout the week, you have a sense and a desire that your life has to count for, for eternity, somehow, some way, someplace with someone. This, that's the infantry stage. And then at the end of verse 13, God gives another category, which, you know, kind of levels of growth here as he, as he does in this descending order. And this, we're still under the main heading of the recognition we're all at different places in spiritual growth. We'll call this the infancy stage. And at the end of verse 13, John says, I have written to you children. As I've already pointed out, this is a different word in the original language uh, than little children in verse 12. I pointed that out last week. Little children in verse Verse 12 covers everyone who has been born again. And children in verse 13 refers to babes or the little ones. And just like the young man's stage is broad, well, this stage is very broad as well. So in Matthew 2, verse 16, this word is used for babies under the age of two. You remember Herod's decree after the birth of Jesus? In verse 16 there, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old or under. So Matthew clarifies for us here this meaning of this the word that he's using for, for children. And it's also used in Mark 5, verse 41. Remember where Jesus raised Jairus' uh, daughter from the dead? It says there, taking her, he, Jesus, taking her by the hand, said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And then in the next verse, we're actually told that she was 12 years old. Well, she's still definitely a child. Uh, and, and then in Mark 9, 36, where a few verses earlier that you remember the, the disciples had been arguing with one another 
about who was the greatest. After which Jesus sat down with them and He said, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Well, then Mark tells us in verse 36, And He took a little child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in His arms, He said to them, Whoever receives one such child in My name receives Me, and whoever receives Me receives not Me, but Him who sent Me. So this is a toddler here. This is small enough you can pick up and hold in your arms. And so in, in these, this category, these are immature in their faith. They, they have faith. They are true believers. They just haven't developed yet. They, they, it's true saving faith. just hasn't been tested, hasn't been deepened, hasn't been challenged. These are spiritual toddlers, spiritual babies. And he, sa and he says the mark is because you know the Father. So praise the Lord. They know God is their Father. And last week we said, you know, God is your Father in a sense. You, you know that he, he takes care of you. You don't really know much about what He does, just like a toddler doesn't know what his or her physical father does, really. You just know He shows up at the end of the day, changes your diapers, takes care of you, holds you on your lap, bounces you on His knee, you know, sits with you and plays along with you as you play with your toys. But you have no idea where He goes or what He does during the day. The point is you have to be cared for. You have to be fed, you know, you have to be served. You're not, you're not ready for any serious challenges. Uh, you have a minimal level of, of having your faith tested. Now that doesn't always have to do with chronological age because depending on your life circumstances and God's providence, sometimes people are really tested early in their journey. Uh, they experience a significant loss or trial or a diagnosis, you know, that's hard to take that maybe even that more older uh, mature Christians haven't even experienced. And when you see that, when you observe that, kind of makes you scratch your head. You know, you sit back and you say, wow, it doesn't make a lot of sense that they should have to go through something so early in their faith journey like that. We've been studying about this very thing in, in Kent Burkhart's uh, class on Ecclesiastes. I mean, excellent class, by the way. If you're not in that class, you're missing a huge blessing. But he's doing a masterful job of taking us through Ecclesiastes. But there's a word there in that book, and you've read it. If you've read the, the book of Ecclesiastes, it's often translated vanity or meaningless. And it's found in chapter 1, verse 14 here. It says, I've seen everything that's under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, striving after the wind. Well, that's a Hebrew word, hebel, but Kent has so rightly pointed out, it's probably better to think of the word as enigma. So when you see the word vanity or meaningless, you probably ought to think about it being an enigma because what the teacher is saying in Ecclesiastes, it's beyond our understanding. Uh, it's above our pay grade. I mean, God is the, creature, uh, is the creator, we're the creatures. We are limited and fallen. He is without limit. He's the standard of perfection. And so when you see a relatively new believer having to deal with with almost a soul-crushing reality, it can be hard to process. But just remember that new believers being stretched and challenged, and so are you just by merely knowing about their circumstances. But those children in, in John's category here are those who basically have an elementary level knowledge of God. That's, that's the child stage. And these children are one of two things. First of all, it, children represents those who are just beginning their walk. You, you know, you just recently came to know the Lord. It wasn't too long ago that you were converted to Christ. But secondly and sadly, the other aspect of being at this child stage is some who've, who've maybe been a believer for quite some time, but they've never really grown very much spiritually. Uh, there could be different reasons for that. Maybe you never sat under the strong preaching or teaching of the Word of God. You never had the full counsel of God brought to you. You were just constantly given the milk of the Word. You've never given the meat of the Word. In some cases, you didn't even know that there were these deeper doctrinal truths out there. And in other cases, you were afraid to even look at them or, or ask questions about, uh, about the Bible. What's more, you've never been involved very much in the community of faith. You know, you've just always been on the periphery. Uh, it's like you've been sitting on the, on the sofa, spiritual, spiritually speaking. And you're not going to develop muscles doing that, spiritual muscles, uh, because while God is sanctifying you by His grace, you can't just, not a formula, you can't just up and decide to do it, but you also have to avail yourself of the means of grace. That's, that's our part in it. 
Regular wor corporate worship, Bible study, prayer, fellowship, participating in the ministries of the church. You have to work out in order to develop spiritual muscles. In order to be strong in faith, you've got to get off the sofa. You, know, you, you have to go out into the, to the battlefield if you want to mature and develop and grow up. You have to serve. You have to get out there and put your hand to the plow. You can't always stay comfortable. I don't have any time to really explain the difficult process of God working in my own life to stretch me and cause me to surrender to Him and eventually do what He called me to do. I was uncomfortable all the time during that process, still am at times. But God brought me to the place where I said, I really wanted to obey Him and I really wanted to do what He wants me to at each step of the way. But this isn't just for pastors being called into ministry. Really, this, is, this growth is necessary for every Christian. And my point is, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable leading or participating or accepting opportunities, the things that God wants you to do. It's essential for every Christian at every level to do that if they want to grow. You have to say, Lord, use me. You know, if you open the door, I'm going to walk through that door. I, I know it's, I'm going to be in over my head sometimes. Uh, I, I, but I would rather you use me for your glory and me be uncomfortable than for me to sit on the sofa and not want to be used by you and just stay as comfortable as I possibly can throughout my spiritual journey. Listen, if you're presuming to do anything for the Lord right now and you're basing it on what you think you're willing to do or you're able to do or you're capable of doing, I can almost guarantee you you're operating in the flesh and that doesn't even count anyway. You shouldn't desire this prima donna Christianity or that God's just going to give you an easy life. You don't see any examples of believers like that when you read the Scriptures. In order to be mature and grow, there needs to be a sobriety about you, a maturity about you. Well, the visible church today is absolutely full of spiritual toddlers. You know, people who've been babies for a long, long time, if they're even true Christians. I think that's one of the reasons the church in America and in many places in the world today is so weak. It's pathetic, really. So we're all at different stages of development. And I think we can see how practical this is because he addresses every person. Now, verse 14, we come to the third main heading, the reinforcement. What John does is a master teacher. He reinforces what he just said. He kind of reviews it for us again in verse 14. He, not, he, he only uses the top two levels or categories, though. Maybe because he doesn't want people to be comfortable at level one, you know, the child stage. Maybe he's just trying to push them out of the nursery, get them, get them to the next level. But he comes back to level three, and he says once again, I write to you fathers. So more mature in the faith, mature in doctrine, mature in theology and experiential knowledge of God. That's the intimacy stage. There's a depth to their life. And because there's a depth to their life, there's a height to their worship. And because there's a depth of their life and a height to their worship, there's a breadth of influence that they have in the church. And he repeats uh, from verse 13 there, because you know him who is from the beginning. So your understanding and your knowledge of God has been so expanded that you, you've grown up. Uh, you think of God at a much higher level. And then in level two, the, the end of verse 14 is the infantry stage. And so let's just, just to sink this into our minds, he says, I write to you. Young men, these are men as well as women in the church. They're young warriors. They're ready to be unleashed. And notice he says, because you're strong. That word there means to be mighty, to be powerful. And, and here's, it's referring not, of course, to body, strength in body, but it's strong in spirit. You're strong in faith. You, your faith has been tested, not as long as the faith of the fathers have, but you do have life experience of God. And you also have gone through certain witnessing encounters. You know, you've had people push back on you. You've had to drop anchor, hold your position, keep your convictions, even under duress. You're strong in prayer. You're strong in commitment, strong in resolve. When you say you're going to do something and serve God doing it, you, you follow through. And so you have some spiritual muscles. And then notice there's this inseparable connection here. He says, and the word of God abides in you. The Word's not just going in one ear and out the other. It's not just written down in your notebook. Uh, it's not just floating around loosely on the periphery of your life. The Word abides in you. Abides literally means to reside to, in a dwelling. It's, it's to take residence, not move out. You've unpacked your suitcase and you've moved in because God's Word has moved into you. And you're like a sponge. You're, you're drinking up the truth. You're soaking it in. You're retaining it. You're internalizing it. You love the truth. 
You're amazed it's taking you this long to learn this. It's like, aha, where have I been on all this? And the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. You know, the one who thinks he knows a lot doesn't know much at all. And so the word of God abides in you and it's spiritual food for your soul. It's what energizes you. These are inseparably linked together because notice you cannot be strong without the word of God abiding in you. And then he says, and you've overcome the evil one. You cannot be strong and not fight battles. I mean, it all comes together. You've overcome the evil one. The word means to conquer, to prevail in battle, to defeat an enemy. So you understand the devil's not a joke to you. Uh, he is the embodiment of all evil. He's the provoker of evil. He's the accuser of the brothers. He's the opposite of everything God is. But notice you're not being pushed around by him. You're, you're, you're actually overcoming the evil one by God's word and the Holy Spirit. So let's end this way. If you've ever had children in, in your home, uh, perhaps the home in which you grew up, there, there may have been a place on a door frame somewhere, a doorpost. And it had marks and dates that measured your height and your growth. You took a yardstick, you measured the height of your children, you wrote it down, you recorded it. We did that. Of course, there's one now in our house for our son, Bobby. Uh, it's, it's there today. But I think that's a good picture, an illustration for us to have in mind as we, as we think about these things, that God would have us stand up against a fence post or door post. And of course, that, that marker, that, that standard is, is Jesus Christ. And we're being measured how much like Jesus are we becoming. So we're, we're, look, we're not going to be able to accurately assess our, our spiritual growth. No one can accurately do that. Even John is challenging us, though, to think about it. Because Jesus is the standard. And earlier in verse 6, before we started in this passage, he said, We are to walk as he, Jesus, walked. So if you're to put you next to that doorpost uh, and take a pencil and draw the line, where would you be? Would you be a level one, level two, level three? And the truth is, you and I are probably lower than we think we are. <laughs> we're, we're, we haven't achieved what we think we have anyway. But if you're at level one, how long have you been there? You know, are, are you still at level one? How, why haven't you grown uh, to the next level? Are, are you stagnant in your spiritual growth? What evidence of spiritual development do you even see in your life? Are you a spectator? You just show up? Or are you involved? Are you, are you trying to press forward? Or, or what level of maturity do you see? Or what level of immaturity? You know, what childishness do you still see in your life? Are you in, are you in the battle? Are you on the front lines? Are you overcoming uh, the devil? Are you strong in your faith? Are you strong in prayer? Does God's word abide in you? Is God becoming bigger and bigger in your understanding? Is he blowing your mind through the study of his word concerning his infinity and his incomprehensibility of who he is? Are you experiencing Him in your life? Is He more than just head knowledge to you? Are you living out your faith? Well, go, go to Him. Ask Him to renew your mind through His Word and Spirit that you would increasingly surrender to His will in all things that He would use you for His purposes and for His glory. Father, thank you for your word today, and we ask that you will help us. Lord, we know we can't just do this. This isn't a formula we can just employ. But Lord, we ask that Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and our lives through your word. Uh, and Lord, you would transform us for your glory. And, and you would use us for your glory and your purposes in all things. Help us to take our eyes off ourselves and place them only on you. In Jesus' name, amen.